and one. So let's officially start here in Songdo. I'm not sure when it is wherever you are, but thank you all for joining us anyway. My name is Ashar Wassam and I work with the IEU. And welcome to the adaptation, welcome to the IEU webinar on the approaches and inception report of the IU's independent evaluation of the adaptation portfolio and approach of the GCF. So as you know, the IU has been asked by the GCF board to undertake this independent evaluation um, under our work, under our 2020 work plan. So the, this evaluation's key aim is to examine how the GCF contributes to paradigm shift in adaptation. And this includes assessing the role, reliability, responsiveness, and relevance of the GCS adaptation portfolio. So this webinar will go for one hour and we will have a short presentation by Dr. Joe Curie, head of the independent evaluation unit, and Dr. Martin Prowse, also my esteemed colleague at the IAU. And then we'll go, oh, and then we'll have a follow uh, by a facilitated conversation by me, your moderator, and also we'll be joined by the rest of the evaluation team who's with us here tonight. So if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box. We also have some questions for you, so please feel free to answer those as well. Now I'll ask Jo to share her screen and start the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asha. Um, really looking forward to this. I'm going to share my screen now. Asha, can you let me know if you can see it in a second? Can you see it now? Yes, we can. Thank you, Lovely. Jo. And it's in a slide mode? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Well, good evening, everyone from Songdo. I'm really privileged to have all of you here. Um, I'm Jo Puri. I head the Independent Evaluation Unit. And I'm joined today uh, by Dr. Martin Prowse. Both of you, us have put together this presentation, which represents actually the work and effort of a much larger team that I will shortly introduce to you. But for the purposes of the presentation, uh, Martin and I have choreographed this overall 20, 20 minute presentation or so. Uh, I'll go halfway and then Martin will take over for the rest of the half. With that, um, let me just introduce the team and uh, the key people uh, other than all of you who are definitely as stakeholders, extremely important to us for this evaluation. So first, just to introduce you uh, to the team. Um, as you all know, this evaluation is led um, um, and um, is led by the Independent Evaluation Unit. Uh, we are responsible, we are, we are undertaking the evaluation, um, and there's a large team um, that stands behind us. I'm supported in this evaluation by Dr. Solomon Aspo, who's not with us today, tonight. Um, he's also the Independent Evaluation Unit, Martin Press, who will be joining us shortly. Uh, Matthias uh, de Brown, who is a senior evaluator and a private sector expert at um, Stuart Red Queen, which is the firm that is supporting us for this evaluation. Galina, who is a data and GIS analyst, so you, I hope you're looking at the right hand side of your screen. Um, uh, Galina is a data and GIS analyst and manages our data lab at the IU as part of its overall day to day operations. Peter Mwandri, who has joined us this evening and who is an evaluation researcher. Byung Suk Lee, who is a um, research assistant, um, who's not with us uh, tonight because happily he's getting married. Um, Rene Kim, who's a senior evaluator and quality assurer, um, and who's also a member of the Stuart Red Queen team. Uh, Max and Sylvia are both here, and Max is an evaluator and impact measurement expert and uh, Sylvia is a research and data analyst. Beside all of them, uh, we are supported by our larger teams, uh, both at Songdo, but also in Europe and around the world. I do also want to introduce you to our advisory group, and we're really privileged uh, to have um, a very august group of advisors who are supporting us in not just ensuring that we're substantively and thematically we're taking the right directions and we're thinking about um, the, uh, the topics and the areas that we can critically help to inform, not just for the GCF, but also for the global community. But they're also keeping us honest about uh, the political relevance of this evaluation, of which we are very cognizant. 
Dr. Yusuf Nasif is the Director of Adapt the Adaptation Division at the UNFCCC. Ms. Christina Chan is the Director of Adaptation at the World Resources Institute. Uh, Mr. Kevin Adams is um, a research fellow at the Stockholm Environment Institute and is also getting his PhD in London. And Mr. Raju Chetri is the Director of Prakriti Resources Center in Nepal. Um, with that, um, um, with that introduction to the team. I do want to put out a few questions that I'm really hoping that all of you can keep in your minds and roll over and think about a little bit as we go through the presentation. Because really the presentation is much more oriented and, and the objective of the presentation is really to inspire and provoke questions and comments from all of you so that it can enrich our thinking as we go along. So here are some that hopefully will provide some food for thought. What do you want us to focus on in this evaluation? So imagine yourself six months from now, opening the evaluation and thinking, wow, I really wanted this evaluation to look at this topic. What is that topic? Second, what is, in your view, the GCF's biggest adaptation challenge? Third, which other stakeholders should we approach? As we go along, we'll give you a quick preview of all of the people we are contacting, getting in touch with, interviewing, um, getting comments from. But kindly do think a little bit more with us about who else you think we should be in touch with. And last but not least, as I said, our overall objective is not just to make the GCF faster, stronger, better in it, the approaches and the strategy that it uses for adaptation. It's also to inform the larger global community in this area, because we firmly believe that it's only if we are able to lift the thinking around the global community can the GCF truly benefit. So what is the best way for us to share the results of this evaluation, not just among all of you, but also amongst the larger global community? Of course, other comments are welcome as well. This is the structure. I'm going to talk about context and adaptation concepts and background, much of which is known to many of you, which would be useful to, for, for many of you to recognize what the conceptual background is. And then Martin will lead us through the, the key evaluation questions that we're asking, as well as the approach and methodology. And then we'll stop. So in terms of the context, all of you, I think most of you are familiar with the independent units, independent evaluation units, forward-looking performance review, or the FPR, and recognize that it recommended that the GCF re-emphasize support for adaptation investments. And why did we say this? Because one of the things that the FPR found was that the GCF was falling short of its required objective of a balance in investments between adaptation and mitigation. We found in the FPR that only 37% of the overall dollar amount, so in nominal terms, was being devoted currently from GCF's dollar investments for adaptation investments. Of course, in grant equivalent terms, there, is, there was more than 60% being devoted to adaptation. But the governing instrument and the reason that we are focusing also not just on the grant equivalent amount, but also on the dollar amount, is because in the governing instrument, the language very clearly is that there will be a balance in, mitig in mitigation and adaptation related investments. And the second aspect for this emphasis, the second reason for this emphasis is that as we think about adaptation, we are holding the end mile in focus. So the person on the ground that is going to be affected by and hopefully benefited by GCF's investments. And for for him or for her, it is really important to understand what are those benefits that are percolating down um, in the last mile to them. We showed in the FPR as well that there is a need to increase private sector involvement in adaptation. 
And we found that in purely adaptation projects, only 2% of the private sector facility funding was being devoted. So these two aspects were clearly highlighted in the FPR. And these and other findings then helped us to, re to create the building blocks for the rationale for why the adaptation evaluation was presented to the board as part of our work plans, as, one, as part of our work plan, as one of the evaluations that we should undertake in 2020. So if, in one, so if you needed one line to understand really what is the objective of the overall evaluation, it would be this, which is at the bottom of your screens. The evaluation examined if the GCF is contributing to a paradigm shift in adaptation and how can it do it better? I'm going to move on to adaptation concepts and background. And again, this is important because the genesis of a lot of this entire debate in the global space is important for us to realize as to where GCF is today and why many of the things are really path dependent. So not just our own literature review from within this overall evaluation, but also a global review that the team has worked on, including Martin and a couple of our other colleagues from the independent evaluation unit. Um, we have found that the adaptation landscape is rightly systems oriented. It recognizes that it's not just one intervention that is going to change how, how people are resilient and the extent of their vulnerability. So it is rightly systems oriented. And they're also rightly characterized by a variety of interventions that cut across different sectors. So it's not just livelihoods and it's not just cash and it's not just income and it's not just agriculture, but it cuts across a variety of what I call, what are traditionally siloed sectors. Despite that, it lacks clear definitions of what is truly adaptation. Just to illustrate this, the IPCC in 2018 noted that adaptation is the process of adjustment in natural or human systems in response to actual or expected climatic stimuli and their effects or impacts. Now, I want you to focus on the definition and recognize that although it is an encompassing definition, it, it is a very broad one and creates several ambiguities as well. Just to illustrate one, the definition does not distinguish between climate finance and on one side and humanitarian assistance that may be provided for climate events, for example, or development finance that may be provided to reduce vulnerability and or increase the resilience of people. Where does one stop? Where does the other begin? That's not clear from this definition. While speaking to stakeholders and especially NDAs, as well as in-country stakeholders as part of the overall inception uh, phase of this evaluation, we also found that it was very difficult for many people in countries to operationally grasp as to what guidance it was giving countries about what they should consider as adaptation finance and what they should not. So operationally, it is, it, it is quite deficient. The Global Commission on Adaptation in 2019 um, found that there are key fragile systems that require immediate attention to prepare for climate change. And the Global Commission focused on three such systems, food and agricultural production systems, water and waste management systems, and urban environments and infrastructure networks. Given all of this, we, to understand as to how we could look at this immensely complex space and still make sense of it and think critically about where the GCF could be located in terms of defining its own niche, its own comparative advantage, and hopefully in a strategy that we hope will be informed by this evaluation, be able to inform as to where and what types of interventions it should direct its energies, investments, and resources at 
given the immense need in this space and the great gap in funding and needs. We've then created a framework that essentially helps us to think somewhat schematically and, a very and in a very disciplined way about where and what types of interventions there are in the adaptation space that can help us to understand as to what types of interventions are taking place and how they may be classified and understood. And I'll talk about this, but essentially they are classified into anticipatory or preemptive, contingent or reactive. And all of these or a combination thereof can be used to adapt vulnerable systems and increase readiness. Let me explain this a little bit more. So here's the same chart, um, I beg your pardon. Here's the chart with the row that shows the same titles anticipatory, contingent, and reactive. And they essentially indicate stages during which adaptation intervention, related interventions take place. Anticipatory before the event, contingent that are contingent on the climate event, and reactive that are reactive to climate events. And on the left-hand side of your chart, you're looking at essentially types of agricultural in, um, adaptation interventions structural, nature-based, informational, technological, institutional, market-based, and social. And what we're showing here is essentially illustrative. So for example, migration, and if you follow my cursor, it's at the bottom of the screen. So migration, for example, could be an anticipatory or a preemptive action that is undertaken to deal in the anticipation of a climatic event. But migration could very well be a reactive intervention as well. So for example, migration may be reacting to a climate event. The important point is to note that many interventions are classified as adaptation interventions um, under anticipatory or contingent or reactive. So these categories by, them, uh, by themselves are mutually exclusive, but the intervention, so for example, flood information services and early warning systems are anticipatory. They are there so that we can anticipate and understand and preempt climate events. But very often they can also be put down, for example, in reaction to climate events because we just want to know better the next time, right? So really important to understand that this is a nice framework for us to understand different types of adaptation interventions. Now, one other diagram that may help to show this overall intersection, but also overlap of um, development finance, humanitarian assistance and adaptation finance is the following. And again, it's the same anticipatory, contingent and reactive interventions. And in our review, what we found is that development finance, for example, providing for livelihoods, for example, cash transfers, for example, um, agricultural and di crop diversification support tends to be anticipatory. Yeah, and this is where development finance will come in. Humanitarian assistance, such a will go into areas that are contingent. So contingent interventions would be, for example, crop insurance that are contingent on an event taking place and the payouts occur contingent on the event. Right. So that's a contingent intervention, crop insurance, flood insurance, etc. Reactive interventions are also supported by humanitarian assistance. So, for example, a climate event has taken place and there's emergency assistance that is required and that humanitarian assistance comes into that comes into support those sorts of things as well. When we looked at the and reviewed the adaptation space and the types of interventions and areas where adaptation finance is provided, we found that adaptation finance essentially traverses the spectrum of those types of interventions. So it will come into anticipatory, but it will also, many adaptation interventions will also be contingent um, and they will also be reactive. Okay. Now, the other thing that we basically um, found, and this is not new, but it's important as, as part of context, is that 
there are a large number of institutions that are providing adaptation finance. And this is important because as we go along and as we think of the goal of the evaluation, it is really important for us to think of where the GCF can come in and, and really make the biggest impact given that there is a large number of institutions, both multilateral and bilateral that are in this space. But despite there being a large number of institutions, there is a significant climate finance gap. Just to illustrate, the adaptation needs as um, having been calculated by UNEP are anywhere between 140 to $300 billion annually. But the available finance for meeting adaptation needs is between 22 to, 22 to $30 billion. There are a variety of climate multilaterals, and many of you know about them. The Least Developed Climate Fund, SECF, GEF, the Adaptation Fund, the Climate Investment Funds. They have cumulatively pledged approximately $9 billion to this space. Despite the large number of institutions and the large amount of, uh, well, and some amount of resources that have been committed to this space, there remains a lack of consensus over the scope of adaptation finance. And like I said earlier, what distinguishes it from similar forms of finance, such as development assistance and humanitarian aid. Now sh shift a little bit of your attention kindly to the GCS portfolio. So the GCF is currently financing, if you just looked at only adaptation projects, uh, 59 adaptation projects, but there are cross-cutting projects as well. And so there are 93 adaptation related projects. And this chart essentially shows in a cumulative way, the amount of funding as a percentage of the overall investments that the GCF has made to climate um, overall. So between mitigation and adaptation, so for example, at B25, the GCF had committed 5.6 billion overall to mitigation and adaptation. And over that, and during, by that time, in US, uh, in US million, it had, it had committed 40% of this overall $5.6 billion to adaptation. Um, in quantitative terms, the GCF has currently committed $2.28 billion to adaptation finance, which includes the amount of resources also dedicated to cross-cutting projects. We also looked at the patterns of uh, GCF investments with, res with respect to most vulnerable countries. Most of you will recognize that a large part of adaptation finance within the GCF is committed through the Division of Mitigation and Adaptation. Um, within this, for most vulnerable countries, again, uh, kindly look at my cursor, uh, $1.1 billion is committed um, as a total to LDCs, SIDS in Africa, and the rest of it is committed to other countries, so non-vulnerable countries. And most of this, like I said, so $1.9 billion is committed through DMA um, in 82 projects and the rest of it, very small amount through the private sector facility. One other thing that we looked at was, well, where is GCF financing in climate, in adaptation really going? And one of the things that has been extremely useful for us is to, um, is to have, of course, the IU data lab that has helped us to think of patterns. Uh, one of the emerging patterns that we do discover is that um, we, while looking at the ND gain data set, and again, very happy to have a bilateral conversation with you about this, but the ND gain data set is a very interesting and well-known data set in that um, it has a variety of national and sub-national indicators. Importantly for this discussion, there are three types of indices that are put together from the ND gain data set by the developers themselves. One is an index of vulnerability. So that's, this is on your vertical axis, and this is at the national level. So vulnerability measured at the national level. The second is readiness of countries, and this is measured on the horizontal axis in this matrix. And what is, um, and each one of these indices is, um, 
is put together um, with the help of anywhere between 20 to 30 variables. But what is important is that when we looked at GCF's own pattern of financing, we found that GCF essentially, GCF adaptation finance is essentially going to countries which are highly vulnerable, but have low readiness scores. At this point, we are still agnostic. We're not making a value judgment about whether this is good or bad, but I would, um, um, I would uh, ask you to keep this in your mind as we go along and to think about where is GCF best located to support adaptation finance. And if this is the right quadrant for the GCF to be present in. More than 80% of GCF's adaptation portfolio uses grants. Yeah, so 82% essentially. And this axis is essentially showing you the result areas for adaptation, vulnerable people and communities, health and well-being, food security, infrastructure, built environment, ecosystem and ecosystem services. Now, this in itself is interesting for two reasons. One, the fact that GCF finance is uh, at least in the adaptation space is predominantly grants. And why this is interesting is because grants are not an imposition on countries and on people, which means that grants can really, at least on paper, be used for innovative opportunities. And what I want to hold in your minds is to think about, is GCF then really using its adaptation finance for innovative activities and innovative and frontier ideas, as it could be given that grants don't have to be paid back to the GCF. Because this is truly an opportunity. Grants can and should be given in spaces where there is truly an opportunity to also innovate. And of course, be supportive of reducing, reducing vulnerability and increasing resilience, but also use the opportunity to think of new ways of gathering scale and replication. So that's one. But the other idea that I also do want to put out there is that currently the GCF is not using the richness and the diversity of instruments that it has within its call to really support this space. So it's, GCF is unique and it's wonderful compared to most other multilateral institutions in that it has the greatest diversity of financial instruments that it can use for supporting climate. But currently, at least in the adaptation space, it is using predominantly grants. So I want you to keep both of those ideas in your heads kindly. With that, I'm going to stop and hand over to my esteemed colleague, uh, Martin, over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. And I'll be introducing the evaluation questions, the overarching evaluation question and sub questions, and then the approach and research methods we're using for this evaluation. So, the overarching question for the evaluation is what does it take for the GCF to contribute to a paradigm shift in adaptation? And the governing instrument mandates the fund promote a paradigm shift in climate resilient development pathways. And under this main question, the evaluation examines four key sub-questions. First, role. So in what subspaces can the GCF be additional and or a leader in adaptation finance? Here we assess the current status of climate negotiations, global financing to adaptation, and we then analyze the GCF's role and complementarity and coherence with other climate actors. Second, reliability. The evaluation asks, is the GCF effective and efficient in meeting its objectives regarding adaptation finance and support? And importantly, what trade-offs exist between doing the right things in adaptation and doing things right? So here we examine readiness, preparatory support, the creation of a successful business model, the scale of adaptation responses, and the degree of private sector involvement. Third is responsiveness. Is the GCF responding to global and national needs? So we examine whether responsiveness is country driven and complementary to other actors as required by the UNFCCC and the governing instrument. And fourth, relevance. 
is the GCF pursuing the right innovation strategies and policies? So we look at whether the fund is taking the appropriate level of risk when pursuing innovative approaches, both in terms of the types of adaptation projects and the financial instruments that are, that are deployed for them. So the evaluation is structured in seven, seven sections, in, in seven chapters. The first chapter describes the adaptation space. It focuses on the status of global climate commitments and how adaptation is conceptualized and operationalized. Chapter two examines GCF's role and what a normative adaptation framework for the GCF could look like. Chapter three looks at strategy and policies and whether these are relevant, clear, and conducive for a paradigm shift in adaptation. The fourth chapter looks at performance. It examines the project cycle, the portfolio, private sector involvement, and the role targets and incentive systems play within the GCF. Chapter five assesses the GCF's business model. It examines whether using accredited entities is delivering adaptation on the ground and whether access modalities and financial instruments are enabling adaptation. The sixth chapter is on results and impact. So we assess how the GCF manages for results, we assess the measurement framework, and we assess expected results and actual impact. Chapter seven assesses the portfolio in terms of innovation and risk. So I'll now run over, yeah, thanks. So I'll now run over the evaluation approach and the, the research methods that we're using. Um, so the evaluation uses a, a mixed methods approach um, to generating data, to analyzing data and interpreting data. So we're using five, five approaches. Firstly, a desk review. Um, secondly, interviews and surveys. Thirdly, data analysis. Fourth, country case studies. And lastly, project studies. So we'll, we'll generate and analyze and interpret both quantitative data and, and qualitative data. So in the desk review, we're covering GCF documentation, um, UNFCCC documentation, um, and project documents alongside academic literature and, and grey literature. The interviews and surveys are part of our consultation programme, our consultation programme with stakeholders. Um, and many of these stakeholders are listed in the, in the following slide. So we'll be, we're engaging with stakeholders from, um, from the ground, communities and individuals, up to the GCF um, board, yourselves, um, and all the way through from accredited entities, executing entities, civil society organizations, and private sector, private sector bodies. The evaluation relies very heavily on the IU's data lab. And the data lab will be using our own data sets um, that we generate um, from funding proposals, from annual performance reports, and other sources within the GCF. Um, as well as secondary data sources, um, such as the ND gain index that, that um, Joe described so well, um, and also GIS data and, and, and spatial data sets, um, particularly to look at, to look at subnational trends. Um, so the data lab will be using this to look at countries' readiness, countries' vulnerability, and more. In terms of our country case studies, we have eight countries that have been selected. The sample, um, the criteria for the sample selection um, was, was quite varied. Um, we assessed project types, funding modalities, um, priority countries, and importantly, over half of these countries um, that, that are taking part in our, our virtual engagements um, have, a, have a readiness program um, with the GCF. Additional to these eight country case studies, um, we'll, be, we'll be assessing three projects in depth, um, and, that, and those, those will be our three project studies um, for, the, for the evaluation. Um, so on that note, I'll, I'll hand back to Joe. Uh, Joe, you're muted. Yeah, 
Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Martin. Um, in this relay, I'm going to hand this over back to Asha. And Asha, with your permission, I'm going to stop sharing my slides as well. Yes, thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, Martin, for that very comprehensive presentation. Um, I've learned a lot, as usual. And so I would like to invite everyone to ask questions. You can write in the chat box. You can also, if you would like, uh, raise your hand and come in and ask your question. But also, if you look into in the chat box, you see that I have posted four questions that we have for you. So if you take some time to look at those, think, think about your answers, perhaps raise your hand. Sebastian, I see that you've raised your hand. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? Yes. Um, hello, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Uh, I'm Sebastian. I'm advisor to the German, to the German board member. Um, yeah, I have a mix of uh, questions and comments, as, as, as usual. Some, some directly to the questions you ask, some, uh, some a bit beyond. I hope that's okay. Um, yeah, first of all, um, no, many thanks again to the, to the IEU for this once again. Uh, great job that, that, that you're doing on this, on this crucial topic for the GCF, but also beyond the GCF, um, as you rightly pointed out. And I think we really appreciate this early uh, exchange on the, on, the, on the report, because as you also rightly pointed out, I mean, it's a very complex, comprehensive, but also political uh, topic. So I think it's good to, to be uh, exchanging on the report and the results um, early on. And we are certainly uh, very much interested in, in, in continuing this, um, this, this exchange. So it's maybe a little bit uh, reply to, to your fourth question. So I am... Uh, in terms of exchange, I think it's really good to to, to keep this going on an ongoing uh, on an ongoing um, basis as the as the report um, develops. Um, now to some more specific uh, points, um, Joe. I mean, I obviously uh, heard your your discussion on the um, on the definitions. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's obvious definitions are, are complex and tricky, particularly in this case. Um, we do think, though, that it might be, I mean, discussing definitions and implications will be important, but ultimately, um, we do think, also looking at the political nature, that sticking to IPCC definitions wherever available is, would, be a good, uh, would be a good approach, because I assume that also going, going beyond, uh, yeah, might also be beyond what they have available. Can, can do. It's obviously important in context and discuss, but I think we need to be a bit uh, careful here and stick to what's agreed where, wherever possible. Um, a second um, comment is also on something you've, um, you've touched upon, um, Joe, um, which is the, the adaptation um, mitigation balance. I mean, as you rightly pointed out, um, um, you can look at this from a ground equivalence and from a, from a nominal perspective. Um, there is, however, the board's decision that this is to be measured in in in, in grant equivalence, um, and I mean, I mean, obviously, it um, it makes sense to look at it uh, also from a nominal perspective. But I do think the report should also reflect the board decision, and uh, in terms of graphics and data, I think it should at least have both. I mean, have a have a picture on nominal terms, but also on grant equivalence, because ultimately, that's. That's the board decision and in, in grant equivalence under the IRM, to my knowledge, um, adaptation has been exceeded. Uh, the goal on adaptation share, I think it stands at 54%. So I think that there should just be, just be a balance. And then, um, yeah, there's a one question. I have a bit more specific one on there's a box, box two on loss and damage. Um, just wonder a bit what the role of this, this box is for the evaluation because it essentially, I mean, it looks a bit at the negotiations. Um, so on loss and damage, it's a bit of a reply to your first, first question. I mean, we were wondering in how far it could be interesting for the report to also look at the COP decision, uh, for the COP 25 decision um, um, that recognizes a role for, for the GCF um, to support um, climate related loss, loss and damage. And I mean, there is in the evaluation matrix I saw in part A, there is also a question which um, looks a bit uh, at you know, how far the concept of loss and damage is incorporated into NAPS and also about sort of lessons learned from building back better after climate related crises. So, I mean, there is sort of some reference, but I'm wondering in how far the, the uh, report could also make a contribution 
to, let's say, the implementation of this COP decision, very much aware that this is only one among many other elements that this uh, evaluation and report could and should look into, into, uh, into but um, thought that might be something, something interesting. Um, yeah, and then finally, just more spontaneous thought on your second question, uh, what is the biggest adaptation challenge? I think there are, I mean, I tend to, I personally tend to, tend to agree with what you mentioned initially, Joe, that it's really uh, increased private sector involvement. I mean, we do see, see a role for the GCF to, and a niche for the GCF to really spearhead innovation and in adaptation, broadly speaking, in terms of the actors, um, but also in terms of the instruments and, and, and approaches. Um, that that, that you mentioned. So, um, yeah, it would be really interesting to learn from the from the report how the GCF could do a better job in, in this regard. And also being very much aware of the importance of country ownership and country drivenness, it would also be, be interesting um, to see how the GCF could enhance the, the dialogue with, with countries and NDAs on the opportunities in, in the adaptation space and the, and the options that the GCF has at its disposal because ultimately funding requests come from accredited entities and, and from countries. Um, so um, I think there's also um, a role for, for the GCF and the, and the reports. Thank you very much. Sorry for taking so long. Um, and yeah, I look forward to, to uh, engage on this further. Thank you, Sebastian, for your question. No worries about taking so long. We appreciate all your comments and questions. So Joe? Would you like to come in? Yeah. On? Sure. Thank you so much for that, Sebastian. As usual, very stimulating questions. I completely agree. Um, we um, actually, very early on, and you would have seen this in the approach paper already, in the, uh, we are using the IPCC definition. But as we do that, I think it is really important for, our, uh, you know, for us to be upfront as well um, uh, in reflecting really what some of the uh, touted uh, limitations of the definition are, although that's the one that we are using. And again, I do want to be very clear about this. Uh, that is the one that we are using, but it's also, uh, but we want to be very upfront about the limitations that it poses in terms of not giving guidance either to agencies, and this has been very well acknowledged across agencies, as well as to countries. And that's what I wanted to illustrate with that. Uh, but overall, the, definitely your, your counsel's well taken. On grant equivalence, again, excellent point. And again, it's not to, com uh, not to discount either the board decision or, uh, or the current measurements on grant equivalence. It's really to showcase the overall governing instrument decision and the subsequent uh, decision taken by the GCF board that, of course, you have to uh, consider uh, the element of risk. So if you're giving out a loan, it's very different because the amount of risk that a country is taking with respect to a loan, very different than for a grant. And we completely understand that metric. Um, but it, for the purposes of um, also understanding as to how much is percolating down to the last mile, we are really cognizant that we should be discussing both of these, the grant equivalent as well as the nominal amounts. And you're absolutely right as well. We noted this in the FBR that the in grant equivalent terms, actually the GCF has exceeded its goal uh, very much in adaptation finance. Loss and damage, again, really good point. And this has been the subject of some discussion internally within the team. What we'd really like is um, perhaps, Sebastian, if you don't mind, and if there are others on um, on this um, webinar who, uh, who could possibly give us a little bit of time bilaterally to, for us to discuss some of the issues that are arising from the loss and damage question and discussion, and of course, of the role that GCF can and could be playing in this space. That would be hugely important. In the framework, and again, it's a very stylized framework that we presented on um, uh, preemptive, contingent, and um, and um, uh, reactive um, um, types of interventions. Actually, reactive can be interpreted as losses as well, right? So there is the um, there is the uh, um, openness to thinking about acceptable losses and those that are not acceptable, and how to parse those. And again, then 
over and above the definitions, where should and how should GCF come in? So definitely a lot of discussion in our own time has gone into this and we'd love to have um, other bilateral discussions on this. On private sector and innovation, completely. Yeah, I, I think uh, we're on the same side. Uh, one of the things I would um, possibly like to put out there, I think for me, this is personally really exciting, the role of the private sector. Um, in a recent paper that we, uh, that um, two of my colleagues and I put out actually, that has been accepted also by the Global Handbook on Impact Investing, we look at the role that, for example, potentially climate impact bonds could play. And, you know, if you know the ESG sector, so the environment, social and governance bond sector, it's huge and it's emerging as even greater, especially during this space, right? And so in the ESG space, uh, there is clearly an emerging space that adaptation finance could and should be playing and those actors should be taking on and thinking about climate impact as well. So, you know, if, if you wanted to think of E as not just E, but also C, so climate, or if you wanted to call them climate environment, social, um, so social and governance impact bonds, that would be fine. But it's clearly important that the GCF could be innovating in that space, in ESG or CESG, or I'm just gonna call them climate impact bonds. And in the, in the paper, we actually use real world climate investment examples from the GCF to discuss as to how the incentive systems may be set up so that governments, NDAs, accredited entities, and the GCF all have the incentives to really support adaptation related benefits for people on the ground. Your last point on country ownership. Again, bang on, I, I completely agree. I think um, one of the things that we didn't mention in our presentation is clearly acknowledging, of course, that countries have NAFs um, and um, also and have thought about prioritizing their own um, set of needs and what they could and should be coming to the GCF for. The important thing is to recognize that there's a huge gap between country needs and available finance. And given that there is such a scarcity, there has to be a way in which the GCF could really come in, be innovative as well as impactful in this space. And what we want to do through this evaluation and with all of you is really to think about how that might be possible. Asha, over back to you. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Um, Matthijs or Martin, would you like to come in on this question from Sebastian? Martin? Sure, I can. Thank you, Sebastian, for those, um, those excellent questions. I'll just pick up on, 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 on one issue, which was the, the loss and damage issue. And yeah, we'll, we'll certainly heed your advice and, and integrate the, the COP25 decision on loss and damage in, in, in the evaluation. Um, so thank you for flagging that up and also thank you for paying such close attention to the evaluation questions, um, which is much appreciated, so thank you. Thank you. Matthijs? Yeah, maybe, maybe very briefly, I mean, the, 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 the points have been uh, more than adequately addressed by Joe, but just to highlight the your point on the private sector. Uh, I think that's indeed crucial if you look at the needs, you know, between 140 and 300 billion a year estimated adaptation finance needed. Uh, and if you look at what's coming in right now uh, from the private sector, it's a, it's, a small, uh, it's a small drop compared to the overall need. So I think that's pretty central in our evaluation. Uh, how can uh, the GCF play a more active role in and an innovative role, like you said, in, in really leveraging uh, the pockets of the private sector, which in the end are way deeper than, than public pockets. I think we've seen some examples of, of innovative structures in the portfolio to date. So we'll, we'll try to highlight those and look at further uh, opportunities. I mean, there should be a return generating element there, but uh, we feel that, um, uh, that there's uh, untapped opportunity here. Just looking at climate insurance, um, uh, for instance, uh, looking at blended finance vehicles, uh, climate bonds, like Joe mentioned. So uh, that is why it might be a bit hidden, but the, 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 the last chapter focuses on risk and innovation. Um, and so I think, it, well, it's broader than just the private sector, but we specifically want to focus on, okay, does the GCF take the right 
level of risk? Does it focus sufficiently on innovation to really contribute to a paradigm shift and to really unlock the finance that's needed to address the adaptation challenges uh, that are out there? All right, thank you so much, Matthijs. So we also have a question from Sean in the chat box and he asks regarding the under allocation of adaptation finance, do you think this is a quantity or a quality problem? In other words, are countries not submitting adaptation product, project or is it that adaptation projects are not being approved because they do not meet GCF standards for what qualifies as adaptation? Joe, would you like to start? Yeah, Sean, a great question. And uh, please forgive me up front uh, if I'm a bit provocative, but I'm going to just say it as it is. Uh, so here's the conundrum. I think adaptation projects, if you compare them with mitigation projects, tend to be far smaller, right? Uh, so it's not as if uh, embedded in your questions, these are actually two separate questions. Is it a quantity or a quality problem? Or, and then separately, what is the quality of the adaptation projects that are coming in? The, the adaptation projects that are coming in, overall adaptation projects tend to be smaller because large adaptation projects that are scalable, replicable, et cetera, require much more work than mitigation projects do. So that's one. Second, then if you are truly, for example, an accredited entity, that has been accredited for large amounts, say 250 million, you're not going to spend your accreditation then coming up with um, you know, adaptation projects because your incentive, and it is truly important for us to start thinking about intra-institutional incentives. One of the axioms that I'm, I'm really wedded to as we think about institutions and definitely GCF in particular, is that structure breeds behavior. Right? And structure includes within it, not just design, but also policies, and also the incentives that are being provided to all of the actors. Here, if you want to commit, and if the GCF, as is true, and as is expected of the GCF, if the big KPI that is being looked at for the GCF is how much is GCF committing, it's really clear that the staff within GCF, but also the entities that are coming to GCF are going to be looking for large projects because they end up requiring the same amount of effort and large projects as small projects do and large projects uh, mostly are mitigation projects. So that's one. And the second th thought that I do want to leave you with is that it's not that adaptation projects are not being approved because they don't meet GCF standards. Unfortunately, and this relates actually to Pablo's question as well, and apologies, um, Asha, for skipping you, but it, because it relates really closely to this idea of, you know, how can we measure adaptation? The fact is that because adaptation projects, very differently from mitigation ones, are complex, they are intersectoral and multi-sectoral, their impacts are far harder to measure. And if you're thinking about justifying them both to the GCF board, but also to the secretariat and to the world community at large, you just have to know all of those sectors extremely well. That's harder than in mitigation projects and uh, introduce and therefore it becomes uh, not so much that GCF standards are high, it's just that they're far greater leadership on definitions and results management is required than is currently available in the globe. Thank you, Joe. This is Sean from WWF. Uh, thank you for those insights and I like the provocativeness. Uh, you've sort of confirmed all the things that I have suspected and, and have noticed in my work in adaptation and particularly the measurability problem is a hard one. Uh, that we spend endless <laughs> amounts of energy trying to quantify how much adaptation you get. And it's just kind of the wrong question, I believe, for this field. And it's, it's, it's prevent, uh, preventing progress, I think. It's getting in the way of getting it done because you're trying to figure out how to measure it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sean. Thank you for coming in, Sean. Um, Matthijs or Martin, do you have any follow-up for Sean's question, but also, uh, 
Pablo's question that Joe touched upon, but let me ask it just to be sure. It's how can we effectively measure adaptation? What purposes can these metrics be used for? What are the limitations and best practices? And how are they being applied to effectively measure a reduction in vulnerability? Matthijs. Yes, so um, maybe briefly coming back to uh, uh, to Sean's point, because I, I, you know, we're, I'm not trying also to to give answers to to questions that that we should give in December, but you know, we have a few hypotheses, of course, of, of why this is. So, I think it's you know mostly because the the adaptation projects are more country specific. Uh, they are they are usually more complex in terms of the number of stakeholders. Uh, they're tailored if, if you if you compare that to mitigation projects where you know wind solar power it, it can be the same in every country you know here the reality is always different always needs to be so it's you know projects are made to measure uh, rather than uh, let's say a more one-size-fits-all opportunity that that's also more common by um, let's be frank a, a part of the, the the AEs you know that 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 are in the in the in the GCF's um, um, uh, uh, partnership directory so the, the challenge really is, you know, how to um, to to find those uh, the right level of innovative projects, um, indeed. And and like I completely agree with uh, with with Sean's point also on um, uh, on measuring it. You know, where you could have sufficient argumentation of why this is a relevant and innovative project that could really shift the paradigm within the country. Um, uh, but at the same time, you know, um, uh, you know, make sure that you have uh compelling arguments for what it could mean but also don't go too deep because if you overanalyze it it might indeed stop the project from moving forward so that's a big challenge and some uh, something we have uh, very prominently on our radar screen um, over the coming months thank you matthijs um so we're nearing uh, 11 pm but i would like to go through all of the questions because we're still getting questions so if you bear with us a little bit longer uh, Giacomo has a question. He's thank you so much for the presentation. So also good. Thank you for joining us. Uh, he says it's great to see the recognition of the challenge for adaptation projects and providing insights on how to overcome them. So in regards to our question, our second question on the challenges, what he says supporting uh, enabling conditions, behavioral changes, and large scale projects, especially that are investment ready for private sector and maladaptation issues. Joe, Martin, Matthias, do you see these as challenges as well for the GCF adaptation? Okay. Joe, yes. No, definitely. Uh, so um, I think behavioral challenges and especially uh, measurement challenges, uh, I think uh, are clearly important. I, I think one of the one of the things, and again, um, this is that time of the day, and apologies, everyone. I'm going to say a few more provocative things. The fact is that currently most institutions that work in this space tend to be supply driven. They they um, and the GCF, uh, you know, given its use, um, currently is, I think, using similar models. But it is time, the Walrus said, for it to think differently about how it can inspire far more innovation and be far more proactive rather than reactive. And that's why leadership in this space is even more important. But currently, most multilateral institutions in this space essentially are, um, think that the, you know, money is key. And essentially, if you just put out the money, everything will sort itself out. But and Giacomo, I, I think this is one of the key things that you're alluding to in your question is that it's really important to create, to close that last mile gap. It's not sufficient just to push investments. It's also to understand as to how you might determine the patterns of those investments and ensure that the right things, that they're going to the right things in the last mile. And I'm not sure, and in climate action, I think this is the poster child of where we think that just putting out evidence and investments are sufficient. 
But clearly in the climate change space, we're recognizing that it's not sufficient, that it's not sufficient for us to be supply driven. It is important for us to meet that last mile challenge where we are also seeing as to how we are able to reach the person on the ground and to make the changes the behavioral ones that are and the ones that are required in terms of our own practice to then bring about the required action for adaptation and for reduced vulnerability that's not always clear that that agencies especially large agencies focus on things like those and unless there is greater change institutional incentives are created within country to create that change in practice and behavior we're not we're not going to meet our last mile challenge Thank you, Joe. Martin, did you want to come in? Sure, I can just follow up quickly. Um, just, I'll just respond to, um, respond to Joe Gomez's question, but just by asking, what are, what are the sort of components of, of a paradigm shift? Um, you know, the, the evaluation's overarching question is, what does it take for the GCF to contribute to a paradigm shift? So what are, what are the components of that? And, and Joe Gomez highlighted, highlighted some in his question. Um, large scale investments, behavior change, but also it's, it's, around, it's around deep change, depth of change. It's around sort of permanence of change, um, policy change, innovation, um, demonstration ability. Um, so there are many, and it's not to say that all projects will meet all of these, but if, you know, if, if GCF projects meet a number of these, a number of these aspects, um, then they will, they will increase the likelihood of contributing to a, um, to a paradigm shift. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Martin. Uh, uh, Matthias, did you want to come in? No. Okay. <laughs> no, I think it was adequately covered. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you all. Okay. Uh, so we have another question from uh, two questions from Ross. He's responded to our guiding questions. He says, in terms of question one, which was, what do you want? Uh, what do you want us to focus on in, in this evaluation? He says, I think it would be useful for the evaluation to cover the suitability of incremental costs versus full cost financing approaches for GCF, including whether or how this has been applied in the GCF adaptation portfolio to date. It seems that there has been inconsistency in terms of how this issue has been addressed uh, thus far and how it's been addressed across different projects, which can make it difficult for AEs to plan ahead. Would you agree with that? So, putting you on the spot. Yeah, yeah no, definitely. Um, uh, I think, uh, Ross, I'm not ready to call it yet. It's a bit premature for us to say that it's been applied inconsistently only because we are looking at the portfolio even as we speak. Uh, but from my own experience with the Jeff and you know, in my previous incarnations, there's definitely, I mean, this incremental cost uh, question is, uh, <laughs> it's an insurmountable one. Uh, I, I know that the Jeff gave up on it, essentially. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, the GCF should now, um, you know, revisit it and try and resolve it. I think, uh, you know, given its own resources and where the world is today, I, I do think that there may be other opportunities for it and other spaces where it can show leadership. But again, um, I'm Currently, I, I don't want to stress, I'm being completely agnostic about it. We're still examining the portfolio. Um, if you give us a couple of months, we'll come back to you with a definitive answer on whether it's been inconsistently applied. All right, thank you. Martha, okay. I also have a second question. Uh, in response to our question, what is GCF's biggest adaptation challenge? He says there is occasionally a tension between, he or she, I'm sorry, there's occasionally a tension between the degree to which a particular adaptation project offers significant adaptation impact potential, i.e. number of direct beneficiaries versus paradigm shift potential. Some of the most paradigm shifting adaptation projects may reach only modest numbers of direct beneficiaries, which in my experience can lead them to be undervalued by the GCF secretariat and or ITAP during their reviews. Would you agree with this, Matthijs? Yeah, I think, I mean, it this is always challenging, right? Because the, the number of beneficiaries are also quite um, a challenging thing to exactly pinpoint, I think, in quite a few of the adaptation projects because they're meant to 
uh, like Joe said, you know, you have a lot of anticipatory projects. Uh, and so, you know, these could have benefits for say an entire country or even the neighboring country. So uh, being led by the number of, of beneficiaries always is a bit tricky issue in itself. Um, and, and indeed this, um, um, you know, the, in some cases, the, the paradigm shift potential uh, might be bigger um, with, with not so many uh, direct beneficiaries that can uh, theoretically be linked to a project, particularly if you think about uh, uh, technologies or you know the, the the first proof of concept of something that can be that can be uh, massively uh, uh, scalable and replicable. So I completely uh, agree with your point there. Um, do think though that you know in in decision making and you know I, I've never been in that seat obviously but uh, I think it's always a mix of interests so I don't think that a project will be completely shut down because it has either you know a hundred hundred percent uh, paradigm shift potential zero percent uh, impact on beneficiaries so it will always be a mix of both um, but I think um, that will take your note into account and see to what extent um, uh, we find proof of this in the um, in the, in the current uh, uh, set of projects that um, that's being approved by uh, by the board because it's an interesting uh, and provocative statement. Thank you, Matthias. Joel, I would also like to hear your thoughts on this. Yes, thanks very much, Asha. Russ, um, I'm going to say this very quickly, but very happy to engage also bilaterally. Uh, Look, when, when we are thinking about this entire trajectory of what sorts of projects that, or investments that GCF could support or any agency, you could classify them into five categories. I think they're mutually exclusive as well as, well as exhaustive. First is, you know, just those that are innovative, right? And those by definition are, the, are, are ones that are highly risky, but, um, you know, it's important to think about where G agencies such as GCF could come along. Then there are those that, okay, they have been, the, the innovation is taking place it, maybe in universities or laboratories or wherever, but you still need proof of concept. And so those GCF could or could not come in. Then think about the next level, which is piloting those out in the field and then gathering evidence as to whether the implementation is feasible or not. So that's the third stage, implementation pilots. And then the fourth, is really thinking about, okay, replicating, let's assume that's successful, then replicating them and finding out as to in which situations these innovations and things that have been proven, and there's proof of concept, can really uh, work and where they don't work. So you're accumulating evidence as you go along about what works and what doesn't and where, right? And so you've done replicate the implementation pilots and let's assume those are successful, and again, this is a very simplified way of thinking about, you know, the trajectory of most ideas, but it gives us a nice way to um, essentially categorize things. So after you have um, replication, then you hopefully have sufficient evidence to say, okay, this works. And you have lots of mounting evidence in different contexts. And that's when you see the step jump and you have a paradigm shift that GCF could essentially come along that entire spectrum of ideas, right? It could come from innovation to proof of concept to implementation pilot to replication to evidence collection and essentially to that tipping point. Ideally, it should come in, most agencies should come in or the GCF could very well say, sorry, we're only going to come in at the last three stages. Right? We're only going to come at replication scale and paradigm shift and the, let the others do it. Really, the board's got to decide that. All right. Thank you, Joe. Uh, so we have an, another question from Zoe. If you have any other questions, please feel free to use the chat box or raise your hand. Uh, also, in, as a part of this discussion. So Zoe asks, currently financing is being directed to countries largely based on vulnerability, high, readiness, low. What additional criteria are you considering at the moment? Joe? Um, very quickly, Doi, so um, I'm assuming you're referring to the ND gain index and uh, you know, one of the other indices um, that uh, they do have there is the governance index. 
and um, that's also available at the national at the national level. We have actually we've only shown you a very very small subset of the overall analysis that has been done, uh, but we have also mapped where GCF projects tend to come with respect to governance. We've also looked at you know other other so vulnerability governance vulnerability and um, readiness readiness and governance in all three, uh, and I think we can show those to you. But those are essentially where at least in terms of targeting where where we have looked at where GCF investments have come in. Um, yeah, but any other thoughts that you have on that space would be great. All right, thank you, Joe. Matthias, did you want to come in on this question? Yeah, it's, I mean, so it's it's a form of analysis that we um, that we've uh, preliminary run based on the Andy Gain Index, but uh, this is something we, we we definitely need to further deepen out because uh, I'm not sure whether we can actually conclude whether financing is being sufficiently directed uh, to the most vulnerable and least ready countries. I mean, we had a discussion about this yesterday with the CSO PSO uh, network, and um, and and there, of course, the point came up that if you look at the number of fragile states that GCF financing has been able to reach, um, that there's a world to win there. So. Um, I, I, I mean, uh, I think we'll definitely try to analyze uh, the extent to which financing has been directed to the more vulnerable and, and, um, and less ready uh, countries. Uh, but I don't think that's, that's a conclusion uh, yet. And, and it might be misleading if we, if we had that slide in. Uh, and, and we'll look at that, of course, from different angles, because you, could, you can give an answer to that question in, in, in various ways. Um, and uh, and try to focus on uh, on how the GCF could uh, could could do that better. Um, so, uh, uh, but this is one of the key questions we have in the in the evaluation matrix and a very central point of uh, of our interview. So, um, uh, more on this in the, when the when the report and the research progresses. All right. So you can look forward to that, Doi. Uh, Peter, do you have a question for us? Feather? Oh, okay. <laughs> I think Feather is a little stuck, so maybe later. Thank you, Doi. Um, so yeah, if we do not have any other questions, please feel free to come in, raise your hand, or hey, Peter, you're back. Can you hear? <laughs> yes. Hello? Hi. Hi, I good to see you. Hi. Hi. Okay. Please so ask your well, question. One, one more. <laughs> Greetings from Prague. Uh, I'd like to pick up on one of the Joe points that there is uh, much less money than needs for adaptation. And uh, the conclusion is that we need to increase the effectiveness of money to be used for adaptation. And the entry point for increased uh, effectiveness of project is the readiness program, obviously. And uh, unlike uh, in mitigation where the country programs are the starting basis i think the national adaptation programs and plans would be would be an equivalent there so increased readiness capacity and focus on the national adaptation programs would be one of the answer that's my first comment uh, second uh, there are some uh, preemptive areas uh, which would be universal to most of countries which is the area of early warning systems and uh, the Czech Republic with the German um, cooperation um, um, is planning now some of these uh, early warning systems in Balkan countries. And it becomes obvious that there is an interest also of private industry and possibly private money to get into the adaptation, which is one of the shortcomings in adaptation programs generally. And my third comment is, that one of the area of adaptation obviously is agriculture. So one of the important strategic partner to GCF on adaptation could be FAO. FAO is a number of local offices, readiness program, uh, emerging projects, emerging cooperation with Jeff, et cetera. So I think strategic partnership of FAO, of FAO in adaptation could be one of the answer also uh, for the GCF. That's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter, for those enlightening comments. Joe, would you like to respond? I agree with all of that. Um, <laughs> I agree that readiness needs to play a far greater role. Uh, we examined this in the readiness evaluation as well, um, as well as with the national adaptation plans. 
Um, I agree that early warning systems are a really big part. Actually, early warning systems are already, uh, I think early warning system is a sub uh, program in the GCF is uh, almost a billion dollars now, uh, if not $900 million. So it's a really big part of the overall GCF portfolio. And uh, FAO actually is a pretty big accredited entity. I mean, um, it's um, accredited if I'm not mistaken, I think for 50, 50 or 100 million. I think it's 50 million, but please don't quote me. But yeah, uh, the GCF actually works very closely with FAO. All right, thank Over you, Joe. Thanks, Peter. Matthijs? Yeah, no, I, I also completely agree with Peter. And I, as a matter of fact, earlier uh, today, I was uh, on the phone with, um, uh, as one of our country case studies, we focus on a number of uh, countries with adaptation projects uh, in place in order to hear from stakeholders on the ground how they are cooperating with the GCF what, um, um, and, and what, their, what their feedback is and what their learnings are. And, um, and actually, uh, through uh, support from the German and the Czech Republic, the NDA in, in Tajikistan has been um, has been supported in a quite early stage, which which was one of the reasons why Tajikistan so far has been quite uh, active and successful in, in attracting adaptation finance. So, I mean, this 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 shows the point Peter made that coincidentally that that we spoke on this today, and on 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 uh, indeed meteorological uh, projects. There are a few of these in the GCF portfolio, and there I think it would also be very interesting. Uh, to see how these can be made uh, more sustainable from a financial point of view. So uh, again, in one of these interviews, we spoke with Hydromet, the organization there, who tries to now develop market-based products uh, in order to sell of these, some of these services in order to uh, you know, uh, gain additional uh, sources of funding, improve their infrastructure, improve the services, improve the level of staff quality, and indeed um, uh, ensure that the citizens of a country and businesses are better prepared and uh, and have early warning for floods, uh, landslides, uh, torrential rains, and all of these aspects. So, um, yeah, with, with very tangible examples, Peter, I fully uh, agree with your points. All right, thank you, Matthijs. We also have a comment from uh, Lorena in the chat box. She appreciates the job by Joe and all of the team at the IEU. So thank you for that. I, she says, I also agree with the previous comment about the notion on the evaluation to cover suitability of incremental cost versus full cost financing approaches for GCF, including how this has been applied to the adaptation portfolio. We have been reviewing the policy on full and incremental cost, and it would be very useful and illustrative to see how these methodologies are applied to the current portfolio. Joe? Yeah, bang on. We, we will be absolutely, Lorena, thank you very much for your compliment. And uh, uh, the team is uh, <laughs> definitely doing a great job. Uh, I, uh, we will be looking at this question of incremental versus full cost. So thanks very much for that. Yes. Oh, uh, Pablo asks, uh, how and when will the results be shared of this evaluation? Yeah, let me just try and answer that quickly. Pablo, so the, I, uh, the plan is to uh, be done with this evaluation by the 31st of December 2020, which means that the evaluation will be brought to the first meeting of um, the board in 2021. Uh, so that'll be B28. And uh, yeah, your guess is as good as mine, but I think it'll be um, March, February or March, whenever the board meeting happens. All right. Thank you. Will it be public on the, it'll be public on the 1st of Jan. Yes, so look forward to that, Pablo. So thank you all. Um, there are no further questions. So I would like to close this webinar, but first I would like to highlight the fact that the IEU will be having two more webinars on the SAP review and the accreditation synthesis. This will be happening the week before the board meeting, you will all receive an invite. I hope that you will join us where we'll be discussing the findings and recommendations of these two evaluations, but also have an engaged discussion on these subjects because B26 is coming up and these are important subjects to discuss. So thank you so much for joining us tonight or this morning or this afternoon, wherever you are. I would like to thank Joe 
for her wonderful presentation and also Martin and also thank you well to the Stuart Red Queen team, Matthias, Max and Sylvia for joining us today and also my IU colleagues uh, Peter and Cortland and also Annie from the ICT help desk who helped us with all the technical issues here today. So thank you all for joining and I hope you have a lovely day wherever you are. Thank you all. Thank you, Asha. You were great as thank usual. You, uh, and <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much, Annie. And thank you, everyone. Right. Much appreciated. Thank you very Bye. much. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Good Bye -bye. to have you here. Bye, Peter.